All right. Welcome, everybody, to Speakeasy JS. Um, this edition is coming to you from Hawaii, at least that's where I am. And uh, one of our, or our only speaker for today, who is going to be James Halliday, also known as Substack, he's also uh, coming to you from uh, the Big Island in Hawaii. Um, and we're also joined by our usual crew of panelists. So today we have with us Nicola and Paul Frazee. So do you guys want to say hi? Hey, Hello. everybody. Cool. All right. So um, so Substack is coming in from a lower bandwidth connection. So he's going to be um, audio only for today. But that's OK, because he's going to be talking about uh, really cool um, NTSC and VHS uh, stuff that he's been doing. And it's all very visual. So we're going to have that on the screen for most of the talks. And it's, uh, it's going to be really great. Um, you guys are in for a treat. Um, so uh, for those of you that don't know Substack, he, um, he uh, probably the way I know him the best is from uh, his work on Browserify. Um, that's kind of the, the main way that I got to know him. And Browserify has been pretty crucial to all the work I've done on WebTorrent and a lot of the stuff that many of us have done. Um, it was the, you know, one of the first ways to, uh, to, to run node modules in the browser, um, which was pretty influential. Um, and now he just does a whole bunch of other cool stuff. He does a lot of freelance work, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer offline mapping stuff, um, and um, he, he, um, he, he just does a lot of cool experiments. And he's been a huge inspiration to me um, personally uh, just throughout my, my time in JavaScript. So I'm really excited that he's going to be sharing his stuff with us today. Um, so yeah, with that, um, you can take it away, James. It's all yours. OK, hello, and welcome to my talk. Can we get the TV up? The, there we go. Cool. All right. So this presentation is about analog television and how to simulate it. And we'll go some places. Um, so if you're just tuning in, if you could go to substack.net slash TV, you can follow along. And I'm going to be announcing the channels to switch to along the way. So. This is the first channel in our in our simulation, channel 63, up there in the UHF band. And uh, all of the rest of the slides are on uh, channels that are lower than this one. So this is the, high, the uppermost into the, the UHF that will go. So we can go to the next channel, 62. And I'll just pose a, a quick question here. What is television? How can we simulate it? And why would we want to do this? <laughs> and so I think um, what I really like about analog television is that the error messages, like the, the kinds of errors that you get are just so interesting, like the kinds of glitchy static. And you can get things that are out of sync and garbled. And it's just really fun. So if you go to channel 61, There's even more uh, artifacts on this one. It's glitchy, it's cool, and, and mainly it's legit. I've seen a lot of um, kind of, you know, vaporwave sort of glitchy 80s retro stuff lately, but some, some of the effects that they use are actually pretty, they're, they're not really like what it was, what an actual analog television will do. It's just like some static over the top or whatever. This one, this simulation also isn't quite true to the all of the alier, all, all of the failure modes that you might get like for example i don't have uh, h sync or v sync implemented but i think it starts to get pretty close like in terms of some of the the effects like with the colors and that sort of thing so channel 60 now we have a cool little animation of sanic and a uh, a family watching the sanic on the television <laughs> And now if you go down two channels to 58, here we have a diagram of a cathode ray tube. So a lot of how television works was created around how a cathode ray tube is implemented. Uh, Am I the only one getting that um, so delayed? No, I'm, I'm getting that too. It's I don't know how. 
Somebody's uh, mic is hot. I'm. It's not mine, but I will mute my microphone. Okay, it seems to have stopped. So, whoever muted. Okay, so here we have a cathode ray tube diagram. So, what a cathode ray tube is is it's an actual electron ray gun that shoots beam of electrons onto a phosphor screen. So phosphors are cool because when an electron hits them, they'll jump up an, an electron orbital and then they'll jump back down again and they'll release light. And these, this stream of electrons is guided around by this thing called a deflection yoke, which is just a bunch of coils that are situated around the electron beam. And it produces this raster pattern on the screen that goes from left to right so it goes left to right, and then it sweeps back to the left side really quick, and then it scans to the right again, it sweeps back, and it keeps doing that until it gets to the end of the screen, and then it goes all the way back to the upper left-hand corner. So channel 57 now, we have a shadow mask. This is another thing that you've probably seen uh, if you were, if you're old enough to have stared at a CRT screen really closely. So shadow masks are one of the techniques for uh, rendering color onto the phosphor display. And they're very, very common. So if you see that kind of pattern of like a one, one vertical line and then another one slightly shifted down, that's, that's the shadow mask. And that's a way of uh, kind of different of splitting apart the red and the green and the blue channels. And uh, that's part of the simulation as well. So if you have a, if you have pretty good vision or a magnifying glass, and you look at the white, like the light letters there on shadow mask, you might be able to see that there's a little pattern of red, green, and blue onto that. So I've implemented that, and I have some shader code that shows how it's done later. Okay, so channel fifty six. Given that. Given how, that we have this uh, this television technology based on CRT tubes, there are all of these different standards that were in place, like uh, in North America and parts of South America and also Japan, South Korea. There's a, there was NTSC, and then other parts of the world use PAL. This is like a slightly different number of lines with a slightly different color system. And CCAM, which was France and Soviet Union, I guess places in Africa used it as well. Uh, but all of that's dead. <laughs> so what are we talking about these dead standards for? Um, they're dead because of the switch over to digital television in 2009. And like, who even watches television anymore, right? It's like MPEG-2 or something. It's like, why do, the only reason that we might care is that there are all of these uh, old devices like, you know, Super Nintendo <laughs> around or uh, like a VHS cassette that all implement these NTSC formats. And they all have these really cool glitches and distortions and things. So now if we go down two channels to 54, let's look at NTSC. So this talk will specifically be about the NTSC format because that's the one that I wanted to do. So that's... <laughs> That's what we we have. It's also the crappiest of the formats because it was slightly earlier. And being the crappiest format is great because it's uh, it's like has the most glitches and like the most colors that sort of bleed together and and look bad. So that's definitely the one that we're gonna simulate. So NTSC, how it works is that, uh, there are these fields sent. So the fields come in pairs of two, and two fields make up a frame. The fields come in at 60 frames per second, so the frames are, so it's 30 FPS for the whole picture. And if you go to 53, the next slide, there's an interlacing scheme that shows how those fields are put together. So basically you take the odd lines, the first field, and then the second field, you take the even lines, and then you sort of smush them together to make a frame. And uh, this is implemented to reduce flicker. So 
I guess that was a big problem that they had is like if things are moving fast at a pretty low FPS, you're gonna get you're gonna get items that are caught like between frames a little bit because it takes time for the the phosphor to or the electron beam to sweep from one side of the screen to the other. So they came up with a scheme. All right, so channel 52. Let's look at what NTSC looks like over the wire, over the radio waves. So first of all, there is a radio signal. This is actually modulated um, by a carrier wave. I don't recall offhand what the carrier frequency is. But the data, basically what that means is you take your signal, which you see on the right hand side of the demodulator, and you multiply it by this, like this sine wave, basically. That's your carrier frequency. And so to go the other way around, in a TV set, you take the radio waves off of the antenna, and like after you've amplified them, and you have some sort of de device that turns them into voltages. So there's two ways to refer to the voltages. Um, there's IRE that you might see a lot. That's mostly what I'll be using in this talk, because it's easier to work with. And then you have uh, voltages. Sometimes the maximum you'll see is 1, and sometimes it's 10. I don't know why. But that that value there for voltage is basically, you know, if you have your Nintendo 64 with a composite yellow RCA jack, it's going to have voltages in that domain and, like, implementing these kind of patterns. And so in IRE units, you the highest you get is 100-ish, maybe a little bit more. And the lowest you get for different kinds of blanking interval or like blanking pulses is negative 40. Okay, so channel 51. So here we have uh, what that kind of signal that we just saw looks like over time. So there's different uh, sinks that happen. Each of these uh, repeating patterns is an individual line. So first we, uh, we do an H sync and then we have a color burst, and then a little back porch, and then um, it's the actual picture data. So that, that picture value um, between 7.5 and 100 is the luminance value, more or less. So if it's 7.5, it's like very dark. If it's 100, it's completely bright. And then it repeats. So then it does another H-sync, and this is all to you know, in case the signal gets garbled or it has to bend around a mountain and the timing gets a little bit messed up or whatever. Uh, so this is the kind of data that we're looking at. So if we go to channel 50 now, we can see this in a little more detail. So there's also, um, this is a, a diagram of an entire field. That's one half of a frame. So first of all, you have the vertical sync. This is the first 20 lines. It has some pulses. And this lets the television set. If you if you've ever seen a, a bad TV signal, sometimes it like can't figure out if it it's like halfway between a frame or whatever. It's like scanning up and down. It's a V-sync issue. Most likely, the television set can't decode the the syncing pulses. Also, there's a kind of a fun thing there. Um, the the vertical sync pulses take up I don't know like ten lines or something of that. But there's a couple of extra lines that you can use before the picture happens. And so that's used, for example, for closed captioning. And then later, I think, for like the TV rating system. So like TV, PG, and that kind of stuff would be uh, encoded in there. And also, there's a thing that McCullough told me about. <laughs> Teddy Ruxpin also used. <laughs> it's like a robot teddy bear that could read from a VHS tape, and it I guess used also those uh, those lines you can use for different metadata. So after we have the vertical the vertical sync, then we're going uh, line by line from left to right. So first you you have uh, so these times uh, ten to the minus six those are microseconds. So you have the front porch, the H sync, uh, then that little gap between the color burst and the H sync is the breezeway. The color burst is used to kind of align the color or to so the television set has a an oscillator that will uh, be used. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but it's used to uh, show what colors everything are. And then uh, we have the back porch, and finally, like just the the actual data, like the is it bright or is it dark? 
data line by line. And so a whole line takes about 63 microseconds. And uh, the whole frame, of course, takes about uh, 1 over 30, or sorry, the whole field takes about 1 over 60 seconds. OK, so now if we go down to channel 47, down a couple channels, let's talk about color. OK, so for color, uh, the, the color space that NTSC television uses is called YIQ, which stands for illuminance, in phase, and quadrature. So very roughly speaking, this isn't entirely accurate, but very roughly speaking, well, the luminance is the, the brightness value. The in phase is more or less the, the color value, like the hue. And the quadrature is more or less the saturation. And so if we go down to channel 46 now, you can see a little uh, RGB to YIQ implementation. So you basically, you copy paste these formulas off of Wikipedia. And I, I think these are these come from a, like an FCC document from 1954 or something like that. And then the next channel, 45, we also have the other direction. If you want to turn YIQ into RGB values, you can use that. Um, there's matrix forms of these as well. So let's go to channel 44 now. And we can see how we're going to use this color space, YIQ, to implement color. So how it works is you take the Y component, the luminance, and you add it to the I, which is modulated by uh, the sine function, and the Q, which is modulated by a cosine function. So the interesting thing about uh, sine and cosine of the same value is uh, whenever the sine is 1, or negative one, then the cosine is zero, and whenever vice versa, whenever the cosine is negative one or positive one, then the sine is going to be zero. So you can pull out those values again. And here we have the the frequency, which is uh, three point five seven nine, etc. megahertz for that color oscillator. So channel forty three. Now we can look to see uh, how that chrominance signal is composited onto the the uh, total signal that we've just been looking at. So there we have the H, the H sync, and we have the color burst, which is about plus or minus twenty IRE. And then um, onto the luminance carrier, we have the chrominance carrier just added on. So it goes up and down by plus or minus twenty IRE. Okay, so let's go to channel forty one now and. Now that we know something about NTSC, let's talk about what our goals are for the simulation. So we want it to be real time. We want it to be sort of plausibly similar to NTSC, like kind of a best effort implementation of the specs. I mean, I don't have a Super Nintendo or whatever or an analog television to test this on. And nobody has a uh, has radio waves coming in from uh, analog television signals because those don't exist anymore. It's all digital. So it's kind of like a best effort with what I have available to me, which is the internet and books and things that I found. And uh, also, let's make this whole thing work in a web page. So this is what you're seeing right now if you're watching this presentation. OK, next 40, channel 40. So we're going to use JavaScript. We're going to write some shaders in GLSL with WebGL. And we're going to write some HTML to put this all together. So all of this is put together with Regal um, as well, which is really useful. There's some links to the code uh, at the end of the presentation if you want to click on those or skip ahead or whatever. OK, so channel 39. This is kind of like a basic outline of how the simulation works. So uh, if we write some shaders to perform this kind of modulation, we're going to get out like a single field or a single frame of output, like um, you know, one field after another. 
And then there's going to be some sync operation. I haven't actually implemented that yet, but that would be really nice to have. Um, that's where you take the signal data, and you're not necessarily sure where the alignments are. Like, you've just plopped a, a VHS tape in the receiver, and it needs to figure out where the frames start and whatnot, although it's a little bit more complicated than that for VHS. And then finally, we have uh, the demodulation, which takes those synchronized fields and writes them to the, the display. OK, so channel 38 now. I have some code that's a basic outline of how the modulation works. So here we have the FSC. That's the frequency of the color carrier. And we can turn, if we have an RGB VEC3, we can turn that into YIQ color space. And then uh, with a sine and a cosine, we can just add together the yiq.x, which is the y value, times uh, the range of that. So that's going to be like 100 is the brightest value. And uh, 7.5 is the, the lowest value. And then we add in the cosine times the i plus the sine times the q. And that's plus or minus 20 IRE. And then add back in 7.5, which is the, the black level. And you can just stick that in your GL frag cord and send it off to the send it off for rendering. That's basically all that there is to it for modulation. Um, it's pretty simple. Okay, so channel thirty-seven. Uh, so in terms of demodulation, the first thing to notice, uh, just a reminder, is that when you have when you have a cosine of something and the value is zero, then the sine is going to be plus or minus one. And when you have the sine of x equals zero, you're going to have the cosine of x be plus or minus one. Oh, that should be plus or minus one, huh? OK, so channel 38 now, or 36 now, sorry. Um, we have that formula for before, y equals, or sorry, y plus i times cosine of x plus q times sine of x is going to be our, our composite signal with the luminance and the chrominance. And if we look at this diagram, so this, um, this sine, these two, the sine wave and the cosine wave here, uh, you can see that you know when the sine value is one, which you can see by this uh, this teal vertical bar, then the cosine will be uh, zero. So what this lets us do, you can see in the next slide, 35, in the next channel, is we get these alternating um, like. Basically, the the Q or the I value at those spots, the slices in time are dropping away because the either the sine or the cosine is zero, and then we have plus or minus the Q or the I depending on like where we are in the phase. So channel thirty four is a really basic version of how this demodulation works. So just like before, we have our carrier chroma frequency of 3.58 megahertz. And uh, then we can do some math here on the phase. So we can pull out the, the I values at TI, and we can pull out the Q values at TQ, and then we can do another sample to sort of uh, figure out where uh, the Y value is by kind of taking the minimum and maximum. So we can read these values from a texture and go to channel 33 now. So here we, we can pull out our basic estimate at the Y value by taking the minimum of all of those signals that we read, the I, the Q, and the X, and then averaging that with the maximum of the I, the Q, and the X signals. And so if we do that, then you can generate the YIQ values from that signal directly by just subtracting the Y value from the I and the Q components and using the, uh, and then you do a small correction based on if you're, you know, plus or minus I or Q. So channel 32, and basically with that information, you can get a pretty good estimate of what the signal is. So like I had that working 
and you could basically make out a picture at that point. But this uh, this update here in the third channel of demodulation uh, shows how to make it a lot more sharp. And that's by doing another texture read at that time slice. Because in actuality, uh, an NTSC signal has considerably more uh, bandwidth for uh, luminance values than for color values. So like the resolution is higher for luminance than for color. So you, you can compensate for that by taking a sample that's not like in phase basically, or with that phase correction. And so you can take the RGB that you get from the YIQ step and then uh, do this value calculation as well. So, and then you can like mix, you can, for example, take that Y value and like multiply it by the RGB and do, it's a little bit tricky from there, but this gives you a much better picture. And then you you cancel out by adding the the cosine times the uh, y iq estimates and the sine. All right, so channel 31. So if we have all of that demodulation stuff, we can render that RGB and V values uh, to the screen. And here on channel 31, we have the shadow mask. So on channel 31, we have the shadow mask. And uh, here we basically just, um, if we have this RGB value from the previous steps, then we can sort of, based on our, our X coordinate, determine whether we should show the red, the green, or the blue channel. Um, and draw little like black bars between them because an actual, like a shadow mask has little wires. That's what, if you like really zoom in on an old CRT monitor, you can see these little wires that separate out the, the color channels. And um, also you probably want to do this mix step, like where it has the mix of RGB and RGB times the mask, because that will sort of emulate how um, the brightness kind of bleeds out from the individual colors and it looks a lot less dark if you do that. All right, so now channel 29. Now that we have uh, NTSC, NTSC modulation and NTSC demodulation here on channel 29. Let's talk about VHS. So this slide is actually interactive. So if you click and drag, you can sort of move the VHS tape around. Um, there are a few demos like this. You can zoom in with the scroll wheel and zoom out. OK, so how VHS works. Uh, First of all, let's go to channel 28 and let's look at how it works to uh, record and to read from a magnetic tape. So here on channel 28, we have a ribbon. And so this is basically how a cassette tape would work. And so a cassette tape is this strip of mylar, and it has uh, one side that has uh, different kinds of uh, oxidized metals, like iron oxide or chromium oxide, that kind of thing. And so here, these little arrows represent the magnetic field that's coming in. So there on the right, the arrows are all disorganized because they haven't been recorded yet. And then in the center, this, this torus is, uh, is the write head. So we're writing data onto this um, onto this magnetic ribbon. And uh, the data signal is there. It's a little sine wave that's in green that's going up and down. And if you'll notice on the left, the values that are written, they vary from going forward to going backward. This is with an azimuth of zero. And if you click and drag the azimuth around, you can see that uh, the direction of those arrows changes. So that's all that azimuth means. It's like whether your, your little um, head here, your magnetic head is, uh, is recording in one angle or another.
Yes, please do load these slides in the browser. It's at substack.net slash TV and play around with the slider and have all kinds of fun. OK, so this is basically how something like a, a compact cassette works with the head there. Um, the, the difficulty, though, is that a compact cassette, uh, the speed of that magnetic ribbon going past is about 47.6 millimeters per second. And uh, NTSC, at, at the highest quality, SP, is 33.35 uh, millimeters per second. So NTSC tape goes past the right head or past the read head slower than a compact cassette. And you might think, well, a compact audio cassette doesn't actually have that much data. So how could you possibly have video um, at a slower tape speed? So if you go to channel 27, you can see how it's possible to have enough data for both audio channel and video channel on a single ribbon of tape. And so here on channel 27, we have uh, the drum of uh, VCR. It's rotating at about 1,800 revolutions per minute. And the drum of the VCR is, uh, is going past that tape at about 5 meters per second. So despite the fact that the tape might only be going, you know, about three centimeters per second, the, uh, the head is moving past the tape at much, much faster than that, about five meters per second. So that's how it's possible um, without having to have like really, really fast tape speeds to uh, encode so much information onto a VHS tape. So this is called a helical scan of the tape. And so typically, uh, there, there are at least two, uh, two heads on a, on a VCR for VHS. And often, there are more than that. There's often four or even six for different purposes. And you can adjust. Uh, this is an interactive demo as well. So you can adjust the speed, and you can click and drag to move the demo around and uh, zoom in and out. OK, so on channel 26, uh, we can see what the tape layout for VHS looks like. So we have these, uh, the, the video fields, you'll see the, the cyan and, and purple or magenta stripes. They're, they're uh, slanted. They're slanted by about 6 degrees. Um, that has to do with how the, the heads uh, trace a path across the tape. And uh, so they also, it, just like NTSC, these fields are alternated. And what each of those, of those uh, cyan and magenta lines represent is an, a whole field of NTSC video. So basically, with two of those lines, you get one frame of video. So these go past at about um, 30 frames per second, just like with, with television. So there's some other parts of this bar. Um, the first part at the top there is linear audio. So there's a right and a left channel for stereo and a little gap of uh, 0.3 millimeters between them. Uh, if you'll remember from the head demo we just looked at, uh, compact audio cassettes go at a faster speed at 47.6 millimeters per second than uh, VHS. So the quality there is going to be pretty bad, as you as you can imagine, because um, it's going slower. It has less bandwidth, and also there's other stuff you know that can can mess with it. Uh, so if we go to the next channel, twenty five. Oh yeah. So, well, I'll talk a little bit more about the audio quality. So uh, the video tracks are laid out with an azimuth of plus or minus six. So basically, what what adjusting the azimuth like this does is it lets uh, it prevents the adjacent tracks because they're very very close together 
they're you know 0 0.058 millimeters um, wide extremely small tracks, um, it lets them not interfere as much with uh, the band next to them. So there's some kind of destructive interference that happens when you have plus or minus an azimuth like that. Okay, so now if we look at channel 24, this is ridiculous stuff right here. So, <laughs> so uh, I think JVC invented this. Uh, so VHS audio quality with the linear tracks on the top was pretty bad, worse than a cassette tape. So they figured out a way to have a signal go underneath the video signal, like actually deeper. Like this, this tape is 0 0.004 millimeters thick, and they somehow managed to like encode another signal at a lower uh, carrier frequency underneath the video tracks. So how this works is they write the uh, the audio data first, I guess with like a, a head that can penetrate deeper into the tape or something. And then um, they'll do the, the uh, video on top of that. And um, the hi-fi audio then has a plus or minus 30 degree azimuth compared to the plus or minus six degree azimuth of the video track. So I guess that works really good because apparently you can get nearly CD quality data from this. It's FM modulated, unlike the linear tracks that are just amplitude. So this was pretty ridiculous stuff. I don't know how this works, but it's really cool. I'm probably never gonna get to be to simulating this part. Um, But, so let's go to channel 23. So I haven't actually gotten to simulating VHS yet because I've only gotten, merely gotten to simulating NTSC and uh, like this television simulation that we're watching right now. But here's how I'm thinking that um, I'll, I'll implement it. Like what I want to get out of a VHS simulation is the ability to take a magnet and just like draw a smiley face on the VHS tape and then see what it looks like after I do that. <laughs> or like to take the same tape and like encode it again and again and like decode it and then encode it and then see how messed up it gets. That's the kind of stuff that I wanna do. So here's a kind of a texture format idea that I've been thinking of for implementing this. Um, it's not very good, like you'd have to have a pretty high resolution texture to encode them at the at the, helical scan angle on the right there. So I think you could probably encode them vertically, maybe not an entire field high because that's like very, very tall texture, but something that's, you know, some proportion of that. And uh, then have a mapping function that kind of lets you do a lookup to see like what pixels you'll hit if you have a magnet that's like this radius or something like that. And then you can like write out to the relevant parts of the texture and then also read from it. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking for finalizing this VHS portion of the simulation, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. And that's all I've got. So if you go to channel 21, 20, and 19, you'll see a set of hyperlinks you can go to to learn more about NTSC and VHS. Then on channel 20, uh, some books including like some particular chapters of those books that were some of the only places that I could actually find good data on some of these technical details because they're just not on the public internet unless you want to pay 145 Swiss francs to get some like IEC document. So, uh, and then finally on channel 19, we have the code for this demo, which is analog TV simulation and uh, a module which is NTSC video simulator that's how you can make your own demo that has like channels and stuff or like that does a uh, filtering of a, of a TV signal and modulating and demodulating it sort of sets up the frame buffer flow that you would need to do that and then there at the top we have a, a GLSLify module for doing modulation and demodulation of NTSC in a shader if you want to mess with those and then please follow me on NeoCities because I post little snippets of all of this kind of stuff. And NeoCities has a really good screenshotting thing where it usually does a pretty good job of rendering WebGL demos. So it looks really cool. And there we go. That's my presentation. Thanks.
Awesome. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> wow. Uh, I have to say, best slide deck I've ever seen. I think that sets a new bar. Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> oh man, that was really, really great. Thanks for thanks for showing us all that. Um, so, uh, Paul, I think you're muted. Um, I, I am, yeah. You wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say one of my earliest memories as a kid was uh, taking apart a uh, videotape because I was curious to find out how videos work and being sorely disappointed at what I found uh, because that, you know, it's totally disinteresting. It was just tape. And so you have kind of finally solved my childhood curiosity about how VHS tapes work. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> Yeah, the, I'm sure that, yeah, the, the level of detail. I, my, my first reaction when, yeah, I, when I started seeing all this was like, how, I mean, I know you mentioned that you, that you found those resources uh, that were free to learn about this, but how did you initially get interested? And then how did you like end up locating that random uh, textbook that you found that was free? Oh, sorry, I missed all of that. Was that for directed at me for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final, uh, yeah. I'm just curious how you got how you got initially interested in this stuff, and then like how how did you go about like learning learning all the stuff oh. that you learned about it? I thought it would be really funny to have like a video game where all you have is a camcorder and a, and like a CRT television and a magnet, and that's what you get to play with, in like a VHS tape and a VCR. Because I I really like the idea of messing with stuff with magnets. Like the other thing that I want to do is for the CRT simulation to have it so you can like pass a magnet over the CRT because they also will like get messed up and like a lot of them have a degauss button. I did that a lot as a kid, so I had a lot of fun doing that. I don't know. I'm just really interested in these kinds of useless simulations that just let you do stuff that would be sort of destructive or irresponsible in real life. Like, <laughs> like taking a VHS tape and running a magnet over it. <laughs> I love it. Um, <clears throat> there was a question in the chat about some of the mechanics that I was also curious about. You had two major steps in your uh, shader. The first was to modulate and then demodulate, and then the second one was to apply the sort of uh, the screen, the black screen effect. And um, the question was generally, where in each of those steps do the various glitch effects come into play? Um, so, if you were to like do one or the other, what would the uh, result look like? Mm. Did we? Lose. Um, I think we actually just lost him. Lost him. There we go. I'm back. Hey, How much of that hey. did you catch? Uh, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll restate, I, I my restate my question. And I'm I'm getting some, yeah, audio, I'm getting feedback some audio feedback now. Feedback now. Is anybody else hearing that? Okay, that seems to be fixed. Um, so I was just um, asking. So um, there were two steps in the simulation. There's the uh, modulation and demodulation, and then there's the screen door sort of effect that you're applying. And uh, could you talk about which one uh, like causes which visual effect? You know, so if you do the modulation and the demodulation by itself, what would you see? If you did the screen door by itself, what would you see? Yeah. So the uh, the shadow mask part, which the screen door thing, um, you'll just see these little tiny lines, and you have to really look very carefully like with a magnifying glass or if you're nearsighted, just like put your head really close to the screen and you'll see tiny little bars. It's not too visible if you're kind of looking at, at it from far away. And then the modulation and demodulation, if you don't have any static effects applied, like if you push the S key, um, you'll see that the colors are just weird and like they create, like there's weird color banding and stuff. That's all the modulation and demodulation artifacts. Especially fun is if you look on if you find a part with like high contrast um, where there's like two colors that are really different or like really light and really dark, you'll get like weird colors like magenta and green in there that just are not in the source image. So that all has to do with uh, errors from a uh, modulation and demodulation. Hmm. Did you find out any other like really weird or obscure secrets about VHS or whatever, just like the history of it. Like, I, I'm actually curious about maybe more if 
you know anything about those metadata fields they used? Or maybe uh, you could comment about like VHS scramblers and how those things worked back in the day. Uh, just some random thoughts. I don't know. That's not one question. Sorry. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't really know too much about the history. I've never even heard of a VHS scrambler, so I'm interested in what that would be. <laughs> or maybe not v, not VHS scrambler, but um, you know, like they used to have these things where I guess in cable, right? I mean, maybe it's not the same thing at all. I don't even know about how it works, right? But uh, like on some of the TV channels, like the adult ones or whatever, they would always like scramble them out, so you had to pay money to get them out or something. I don't even know how that all works like you know way before my time really but yeah i have no idea but that would probably that would have to be on cable not uh broadcast television because they're it's like you can't um encrypt things or whatever on broadcast television it has to all be in the open hmm. yeah well i know like they had like something where it was like they would encrypt it and then you had to get a special box on your tv or whatever that would decrypt it and then, like, people made, like, these scramblers or whatever that would, like, hack this thing. There was some weird arms piracy race going on back in the day. Yeah, like, for cable or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah. Also, do you know, like, is there, what's different between cable and broadcast? Is it just, like, one goes over a wire and the other one goes over the air? Yeah, I think maybe also in the UK they had uh, over-the-air broadcast. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe I don't know what I'm talking. Yeah, I about. think if there was some descrambler, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have anything to do with uh, the signal itself. Um, probably it would only work over cable because I would imagine you'd need pretty high fidelity to make that work. So, like a lot of analog distortion, it probably just wouldn't work anymore. So I'm getting um, I'm getting a message from. Uh, John Heisey, um, over over text. He's not in the he's not in the chat, but he's texting me that there actually was pay broadcast TV in France. For some reason, they were encrypting broadcast TV there, um, and uh, I guess yeah, he's he's aware of like some history where they did that. But he also he's also asking a question: um, uh, Do you plan to implement a tuner that actually modulates different channels on different frequencies and handles sound? That was, do I plan to implement a tuner? And then I didn't catch the next part. Oh, uh, do you plan to implement a tuner that modulates different channels on different frequencies and handles sound? Ah, uh, that would probably not run in real time anymore. This is, <laughs> this is already pushing it pretty much to the edge, uh, what you can do in real time. I don't know, maybe there's some other tricks I could do, but, um, like, I don't even think you could probably modulate the carrier signal onto this. And like, if you had to, yeah, physical things have really, really, really high bandwidth. <laughs> and it's difficult to simulate them with like reasonable fidelity sometimes. Yeah. On could that, uh, work with an SDR maybe, or uh, like, is, like, is there a way that you could maybe, I mean, broadcast these things anymore but if you had like a signal from an sdr could you uh like render it using this system theoretically or what would be missing to make that work yeah you should you should be able to do that i'm not exactly yeah. sure i probably like got the chrominance phase off so the colors would be wonky i probably made some other errors but yeah if it if it didn't have too many errors it would probably probably yeah. work hmm cool so on the uh, VHS simulation that you're thinking about doing, um, it seemed like what you're suggesting is that you're actually going to be laying out the data in memory to mimic the way that the data is laid out in the VHS, and then you're going to be sampling against that data set positionally to try to simulate the sort of um, imprecision of the reads. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. getting stuff like crosstalk to work so like the channels would bleed into each other also like doing blurring and introducing like high frequency noise from like the components in the vcr and other sources all that kind of stuff just basically all of the things that makes that makes like all the youtube uploads of the really janky like weather channel 1997 videos look so so cool and like glitched out like the v-sync is off and the h in the color and the sound sounds like really garbled 
Yeah, it's super, super cool. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the VHS uh, uh, shaders if you get to them. Yeah. Yeah, I also think this is very cool. So. Yeah, so, oh, the other thing I didn't mention is for the texture, um, the, like, the red, green, and blue channel would be the actual magnetic, um, like, the magnetic vector in three-dimensional space. So... <laughs> so like, if you pass a magnet over it, that's going to influence it in three-dimensional space. Like each of those magnetic particles is going to reorient in some way, and the head, the head like picks things up in a in a plane, and so you have to think about like how that is going to attenuate the signal, like in hmm. in that sense. I don't know. It should be pretty cool if I can get that to work after like the H sync and V sync. It's for real simulation. You're you're really simulating the actual mechanics. Yeah, but also like there's with any simulation, there's trade-offs that you have to make to make it run sure. Like in real time or whatever. Cool. Super cool. Um, are there any last questions before we uh, we go to the social part of the event? Uh, Oh, there's some. There's a question in the chat here. I'm seeing. How long did it take to make? Many weeks. <laughs> and I started really uh, sprinting on this hard maybe like two weeks ago. So this is kind of playing with it as a toy before that. When Faras asked me if I wanted to do a talk, and then <laughs> then once I had committed to give a talk, I actually had to make something that worked. So, and I had to put all of those fucking slides together. <laughs> that took forever. <laughs> <laughs> right. I imagine. Yeah, the, the little 3D models of the, of the like, read head on the, on the like, that thing. All that was so good. It was really, really good. Yeah, that's no joke. I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah, that's all procedurally generated uh, assets, too. So it's, like, the equation to do a toroidal... Uh, helix around the little torus with a gap in it. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, you really do win the, the slides war on this one. I think somebody's got to work very hard to top this. Yeah, this is great. You know, when when, we, when I was uh, talking to the first couple of people about doing this whole speakeasy JS thing, um, uh, I was talking to Michael Rogers, and he was saying that uh, he had a similar idea for an event of just sort of getting people, friends together to, to show off and sort of try to like one up each other. It, it, that's not really what this is. It's not about one upping, but like, uh, you know, I think if, there, if that was what this was, uh, those slides are definitely uh, <laughs> hard to beat. But uh, yeah, super cool, super, super mad sciencey, um, right up the, the alley of what I was trying to go for in this event and trying to highlight kinds of projects that people do just because they're interested, not because there's some kind of corporate use case in mind or some enterprise customer who's going to like use this open source package. It's just purely like because you think it's cool and because you want to do it. Uh, I love it. So uh, does anyone have anything else to, to, to say? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go into the social part of the event. Any last thoughts? Cool. All right. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again, James. That was amazing. Uh, thanks, Paul and McCullough, for joining on the panel. and.